pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's speaker, a very dynamic individual. Our speaker began his professional career as an accountant with Arthur Anderson in 1962. In 1964, he was elected to Congress from Westchester, New York, as the first practicing CPA, where he remained until being gerrymandered out by Governor Cuomo. 84, by the way, not 64. I'm not that old. <laughs> 1984. <laughs> it's okay. Another success, a successful author and well-traveled speaker. Please join me in welcoming former Congressman Joseph J. Diagordi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. This is on the cover of the book. You know what it is? It looks like a credit card. But this is a congressman's or congresswoman's voting card. We vote at the end of a row of seats in a computer. And when I use this in Congress, I said to myself, every time I put this in, I'm raising the national debt. Because we don't raise enough money for the expenses. So every time we put this in, we were raising the national debt. Because we weren't raising enough money to cover what we were spending. And that was back in the Reagan years. I was elected in part with the coattails of Ronald Reagan in 1984. And by the way, I was a Republican elected in a very liberal Democratic district. No one thought any Republican could ever win it. You might say I fooled them. I became the accidental congressman. And then a CPA entered the Congress for the first time in history. I'm the only practicing CPA ever elected to the U.S. Congress, House or Senate. Imagine that. Okay? When I left in 1989 because of political shenanigans, I left behind 286 lawyers. Imagine a place with 286 lawyers and no accountants. That's what you have in the House of Representatives and the Senate. But in any case, this is a congressman's voting card, and I put it on the front cover of this book. The Congressional Credit Card. Credit line unlimited, expiration date never, built to future generations. And this book was written in 1992. It's like I wrote it yesterday. Everything in this book is exactly on point. Don't worry that it was written in 92. The only things that have changed are the numbers. We were talking about billions, hundreds of billions then, now we're talking about trillions. And I'll get to that in a minute. But first, let me introduce Thank you, Rich, by the way, for having me and the committee from Sumter County, the Republican Club. I understand that you're an active group. I wish we were as well organized in New York. You know, the Republican Party in New York has been in trouble. When I went to the House in 1985, out of 34 seats, 17 were Republican, 17 were Democrat. Now, fast forward to today, we are down to 29 members of the House in New York. Why? We've lost population relative to California, Florida. Many of you have moved here. So now we have less. But worse than that, we only have five Republican seats and 24 Democratic seats. So look how tough it is right now in New York. Not good. We've gotten a good dose of Florida in just a, a week. Uh, we went to the villages. Today in the villages. We were in the villages last Thursday with the Baratas. And today I went down to the plantation. What a wonderful place. But you know what? This place is only as good as America is going to be. You know, there were no safe rooms on the Titanic. You could build the biggest penthouse you wanted on the Titanic, while all those period people were in steerage. When the boat went down, it took everybody with them. That's where we are today in America. If we start shooting holes in the boat, and there are many reasons why I see bullets being shot in the boat that we are all in, we all go down together. And there is a fiscal crisis of the greatest proportion that I've ever witnessed certainly since I was in Congress. And that's the reason I wrote this book. If you look at the back of this book, look at, you remember Peter Grace? You probably remember him, the Grace Commission? Okay, yeah. So he was the first one that read the manuscript and he said, Joe Diagordi is one of the real heroes on the war on waste. In this book, Joe reads the riot act. And I do, I use very outrageous language to get the point across, because I wanted you to understand how bad it is. Reads the riot act over how our lawyer-filled Congress mismanages your money and cooks our nation's books using numbers like a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination. 
And then Bill Simon, former Secretary of Treasury. Jody Aguardi has written a courageous and practical book about the phony budgeting process Congress uses to sustain its financial profligacy. He has both a keen understanding of its accounting imagery and some excellent suggestions about how to straighten out the budgetary tangle. If you read the chapters in this book, and you may not want to read it all in one sitting, I think it's too much to take, but I put titles like, for Social Security, Congressional Child Abuse, Send the Kids the Bill. The biggest Ponzi scheme in the world is our Social Security system. Let me stop right there to tell you why, because that's the way our accounting system is built. Social Security. Do you remember 1983, there was a crisis? Just before I went to Congress, we had a commission to save Social Security. What did they do? You remember, they raised the rate and the base. It was called the FICA tax. You all know that, correct? We accumulated a lot of money. Unfortunately, we didn't leave it where we said it was supposed to be, in a trust fund, in a lockbox. Gore said that. If you let me your president, that will never be touched. It was already done. And it's been gotten worse since he said that running for president. What they did is they literally took the surplus from the Social Security trust account. And that's not the only one. We have other trust accounts. Highway trust fund, and you have a number of other things where we have so-called user taxes. They're supposed to stay in that fund. They don't because Congress needs the money. And when they see cash, they try to grab it. And guess who started that? A Democrat, Lyndon Baines Johnson. It's all in my book, but I'm gonna give you kind of a, a little taste. So I hope you read this book. And by the way, I brought many, many more. And if you really feel disappointed in this message, and you feel angry enough to act, please take the books, as many as you want. I've got more in the car. Send them to your daughters, your sons, your relatives around the country, say, I've heard this guy be a warning, read this book, send a letter to your representative. Nothing changes unless the people get involved. And that's the complacency that you were talking about before. And that's what happened to Rome, by the way. All the patronage, the complacency, the affluence led to its demise because people didn't see the barbarians at the gate. We have new barbarians at the gate right here. It's called physical security. You're hearing it every day with the trillions that they're going to be spending without the oversight that I was used to in the public, in the private sector. Without that oversight and governance and transparency and accountability, and believe me, it doesn't really exist in Washington. They throw around the words like drunken salads, but they don't really know what it means. Everybody wants to say today accountability. They didn't say it back then, but all of a sudden that's the key buzzword, accountability. But you have to understand, you can't have accountability without a good accounting system. And let's get back to the surpluses. What happened to those surpluses? All right, national debt. At the end of the last fiscal year, one of fiscal years, September 30th, 2008, the national debt that you know about, that was advertised to you, because it was the debt that was embodied in treasury bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds, you know, two years, five years, 30 years, was $9.3 trillion, okay? Now it's well over 10 trillion. The debt limit was 9.8, it's already been raised. You cannot sell bonds in this country unless Congress passes a law to raise the debt limit, and that's how they get the money to spend. Now, 9.3 trillion, let's stick with that number for a minute. Let's break it down. Of the 9.3 trillion, 4 trillion, was treasury bills that were put in the Social Security Trust Fund and the Medicare Fund and in those other trust funds, mainly Social Security. Four trillion, an IOU was put there. We took the money, this was the payroll tax, it's supposed to stay there, it didn't stay there. We took it out and what do we do? We spent it. We spent it on other parts of the budget. But in the meantime, what did Congress do? Congress took credit for reducing your income taxes and we saw the income tax rates go down, but the payroll taxes were going up. Now what did that do to America? Well, number one, it wasn't fair, because the payroll tax is the most regressive tax in the world. It's even more regressive than the sales tax. It's put on the poorest people in America. What do I mean by aggressive? Uh, regressive, you could be homeless, work two weeks a year, 
pay Social Security, FICA tax, and you can't get a refund. It's not. Sales tax, at least they have some exemptions for clothes and things like that. So here you had the tax base shifted from wealthy people, upper middle class, down to the poor. Now, that's a political decision that was made. It may not be fair, but shouldn't we have kept the money in the trust fund? Shouldn't we have kept it there so that the next generation knows that the money we collected is there for them? No. We're on what you call a pay-as-you-go system. In fact, you know what the Social Security law says? That if the fund runs out of money, we're under no obligation to pay. And because of that, I had to testify in Washington three weeks ago because there's a group called the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board that are preparing financial statements for the United States of America, an idea that my firm came up with and I brought to Congress with me. And guess what they concluded? That we should not show a liability for Social Security because if the fund runs out, we don't have the obligation to pay. Now, I left my little CD with Rich here because I got it just a couple of days ago, my testimony in front of this group. I hope you can play it on one of your TV shows and you'll see how I really laid into them on the nonsensical <coughs> way the government is accounting for your money. But getting back to that surplus, you have $4 trillion that's now in private hands in the trust fund. You have $5.3 trillion held by the public. And of the $5.3 trillion, and you may have some of that in your pension fund plans and things like that, guess what? $2 trillion is owned by China and Japan. $2 trillion. Now, lately, Hillary Clinton went to China. She's always talked about human rights. Did you hear her say one peep about human rights when she was in China, about Tibet? Not a peep, because we need them. So now money is starting to affect public policy. Are we gonna now be a hostage, not only to Saudi Arabia and, 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 and the Arab Emirates for oil, but now we're gonna be a hostage for money from China and Japan? Is this the America that we're gonna pass on to the next generation? Now, that's the good news. Let me give you the bad news. Would you believe that $9.3 trillion is just what is the bonded debt? Have you read the papers lately, the Pete Peterson Foundation? Maybe that's the best way for me to explain it to you. There are other ways that I could, but two-page ads are being taken out in the New York Times, others. Pete Peterson made $5 billion selling his shares of, uh, what was it, Black... Blackstone. Blackwater, was Blackstone. It? Blackstone. Blackstone. And he put a billion dollars in the Pete, Peterson, the Pete Peterson Foundation, and he hired away one of my former partners from Arthur Anderson, who was the Comptroller General of the United States of America. One of the most independent people you could find because he has a 15-year term that is not coterminous with any election of any politician. So he's the most independent person. Well, he must have been paid a lot of money. He's not there. He left five years before the term ended. But now he is working with Peterson. And the two-page ad they took out, the one that I saw in the Times, lists all the things going wrong. And guess what the first point was? That the Liability for just Social Security and Medicare today for those that are living and taking the actuarial computations by, you know, actuaries based on mortality is $53 trillion. That's the amount that we're not putting on the books because politicians don't want you to know that that is going to be a financial tsunami on the next generation. Do you think if we can tell the next generation we're going to walk away from Social Security? I doubt it. Politicians have been elected on it. Lockbox, trust fund. They've promised it. They've gotten elected on it. They've extended, the people have extended their political capital because it was morally presented. This is the right thing to do for America. And that will be in Chapter 5, I think it's Chapter 5, Congressional Child Abuse, Send the Kids Bill. Uh, we've got now a lot of other chapters in here, and let me just get to one other. And one of them, by the way, is on the budget process. I call the plastic budget, and you'll see every gimmick in the world to try to make it look like the budget is balanced at the end of the year. We know it's not a balance because they have to borrow money, but they try to put the best face they can on it. 
But the other big issue here is chapter 4. Now, when I wrote this chapter 4, I could not have imagined that today we would be thinking that the United States might go the same way as New York City did in 1975. One of the reasons I ran for Congress was I was one of the young partners on a team of Arthur Anderson partners in 1975 that was hired by the Treasury Department as a condition for the bailout of New York City. Remember, we had to give money to the Big Mac, Felix Roth, Hayden, the investment banker. Well, I learned a lot, and our firm learned a lot. And the partner who was in charge of the firm felt this was such a debacle that maybe we should look at the federal government and see whether we can piece together the financial statements of the federal government. And this group of partners, including myself, worked for over a year to do that, and we came up with a prototype statement called the Consolidated Financial Statements of the United States of America. That today is being published by the Treasury Department. That's why I went to Congress three weeks ago, or in front of this board three weeks ago, because I saw that they were drifting away from the principles that Arthur Anderson came up with at that point on what's a liability and what's not a liability, and that now this is becoming part of the political equation, which should not be. And one of the things I wanted to remind them was your board, and I looked them straight in the eye, I said, 25% of your money comes from the Treasury Department, 25% comes from the Congressional Budget Office, and two other agencies. That means that you have a conflict of interest. Because any time the Treasury is involved, that means it's the administration that is speaking. And no administration, whether it be Bush or Obama, wants to give you the bad news. And that's the problem with America today, our election, our elective system. Everybody is looking to pass the bad news on to the next group of people who get elected. The House, every two years. The Senate, one-third every two years. And the President, four years. But what's happened, my experience is that no one wants to tell the public the bad news. And that's why I felt compelled to write this book. And I hope you read it and you send it to as many people as possible. Let me read you something from page 29 of this book. 29. You go back. Let's go back to the roots of America. Get that mic. Yeah. Here. 29. This is President Jefferson writing to his Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin, quote, I think it an object of great importance to simplify our system of finance and to bring it within the comprehension of every member of Congress. The whole system has been involved in an impenetrable fog. This is back in 1802, imagine what he would have said today. There is a point on which I should wish to keep my eye a simplification of the form of accounts, so as to bring everything to a single center. We might hope to see the finances of the Union as clear and intelligible as a merchant's books, so that every member of Congress and every man of any, of any mind in the Union should be able to comprehend them, to investigate abuses, and consequently to control them. He said that in 1802. This is exactly what we need today. That's why I went to Washington. They gave me a book to read. It was the Consolidated Financial Statements of the United States of America. I went down with Shirley a day early, just realizing I'm a CPA, someone who served in Congress, on the Banking Committee, Government Operations. If I didn't know what was in that book of 110, I would look like an idiot, even though it was a very complex thing. So I went the day early, and I read this pretty much cover to cover. Couldn't read all the footnotes, but I did that. And I said to myself, this is the transparency we have today in America. First of all, you can't get a hard copy unless you have a connection. It's on the internet. This is the way we're reporting to the citizens of the United States of America. Most citizens don't own stocks directly. If they do, they do indirectly. They own them in their pension funds. Why do I say that? That means they're probably not used to seeing income statements and balance sheets. And here we have 110 pages of the balance sheet and income statements of the United States of America, prepared, by the way, not on the basis that the SEC forces a publicly traded corporation to prepare its books, 
where you can get arrested for securities fraud or indicted if you're on that board, and yet we have the worst accounting system and they're using it to prepare those books. And the system I'm talking about is the cash basis. Now many of you are not accountants. You probably don't know the difference between the cash basis and the approval basis. But guess what? Neither did President Reagan and, did, and, and Howard Baker and Dick Cheney. And look at my letters to them in the appendix. Because when I got there, I didn't want my president, President Reagan, to look like a jerk. And I knew there was so much off the books. And I said, as of January 1, Mr. President, why don't you put the books of America on the generally accepted accounting principles like the SEC? It's called the accrual basis so that people know that you are not responsible for that. That's the past, all right? I get a letter back. I get, uh, not a letter, but I get uh, a call on the House floor from Mr. Cheney. He was then the Republican conference chairman. He says, Joe, they called me from the White House. We sent them this letter, and they, uh, they want to understand more about how this thing works. Can you come up with a simple explanation of the difference between general accepted accounting principles and what the government's using? And here's my letter to Dick Cheney. You'll see it in the appendix. 1987, I believe. And then you'll see all the correspondence. It's unbelievable the lack of knowledge when it comes to accounting, and everybody says they are accountable. How can you be accountable if you don't have an accounting system that tells you the truth, that records not just the flow of cash, that's what you do when you write your checks in your check register. You're on the cash basis. When you write the check, it's an expense. But on the accrual basis, generally accepted accounting principles, you don't have to write a check for an expense. You get a bill, you gotta put it on the books. That's an expense, I gotta pay for it. Even if I pay for it later, that's an expense this year. And if there's a receivable and I don't get the cash, that's income this year. Now believe me, the government has very few receivables, but a lot of payables. So please, don't worry about the receivables. Don't worry about the other side. But we don't have any government today, people who understand these simple concepts. Now, I told you, I was the only practicing CPA. Why did I say practicing? Because believe it or not, I found five other CPAs, but they were attorneys who passed the CPA exam in states that didn't have a practicing requirement and they were really practicing law and maybe something in taxes. Now, worse than congressmen and congresswomen not being accountants, what about the staffs? All these young people, guess what they are? Master's degrees, political science, English, history, you name it. Maybe a few have masters of business administration. I can find one. I had to write all my speeches because my staff didn't understand this stuff. Jesus. And that's 1985, 6, 7, 8, and 9. I haven't been there since then, but that doesn't mean I haven't been active. Look at my website. Did you pass out cards, everybody? If you don't have my business card, please take it with you and look at Truth in Government foundation I set up after leaving Congress. It's already, you know, 20 years old. That foundation has many of my, all my recent speeches, my archives, and it has a lot of information about this issue. Not enough people are understanding this. So we need to get this message out to as many people as possible. Now, where do we stand today? It's frightening. You're reading it every day, I'm sure. <coughs> the Obama administration, they will project that hand. they will have a trillion dollar plus deficit, a trillion dollars less than what we bring in is going to be borrowed every year for at least the next six years. And in a couple of the uh, front years, it's going to be more like two trillion or close to a trillion dollars. They are projecting, if they don't project it, I've heard it projected by others, then we could very well spend, borrow another $10 trillion in the next 10 years. Now, I heard Obama speak the other night. He's very glib, very smart. He's great rallying people, and I hope his plan works, because he's now going all in, as they say in poker. He not only wants to solve the immediate budget problems, he wants to solve the energy problem, 
He wants to solve education, and he wants to solve the, uh, uh, what's the other big one? Health care. If you get health care, that's a big one, a real big one. Now, we're only going to get one shot at this. This is not baseball. If, if we miss out on this, you're going to see the most horrendous inflation America has ever had. Do you remember back with Jimmy Carter? I was a partner in Anderson. I had a couple of investments. Do you know the prime rate was 21 percent? They were 22. And inflation was, was right there too. Now, imagine, this already happened. Could it happen again? Well, we know that the interest rates are being kept artificially low. Why? Because we want people to go back into the housing market. We try to make money available. We, this is what we have to do. We've got to get people back in jobs. We've got to keep people in their homes. Even people who can't afford to pay the whole monthly mortgage should be put kept in their homes. The vandals are taking over these homes. They're taking the tower out. This is ridiculous. And when a couple of homes go, a block goes. If a block goes, a neighborhood can go. And it costs a fortune to bring it back. This is nonsense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Obama thinks he has the right answers. I disagree with some of them. I've already written a letter to the New York Times. It wasn't published. But he, he feels... I wonder why. <laughs> he feels that he's got some answers. Now, frankly speaking, we're, we are in uncharted waters. We've never been here before. We shouldn't be here. Now, we're Republicans in this room. Don't let Mr. Bush off the hook. One of the reasons that Republicans got disenchanted was that Republicans spent like drunken sailors in the last 10 years, too. And worse than that, Mr. Bush did not put the cost of the Iraq War or the Afghanistan War on the books. He had special supplementary appropriations, and they were not in the budget deficit. So Obama is now saying, I'm much more accountable than Bush, because why my deficit is bigger? Because I'm now putting all these on the books. That's a scam, because it's bigger for a lot of other reasons. But he's using that as the excuse that I'm better than Bush because I'm putting everything on the books. That's his excuse to spend more than anybody could ever dream. Okay? But I am an optimist. I'm an activist. I'm going to continue to go around America, give out copies of this book, and I print 10,000 copies at a time, and I give it out at universities and some high schools and come to some clubs like this one because I want people to know that there's something that's important that you don't know. And without using this to become a constituency for change, it's not going to change. Without the people getting back in action, nothing is going to change. Congress will only do something if they know that someone's on their back, if there's a constituency for it. And so far, there's not enough constituency for this. So I don't want to be a general without an army. Are you ready to be soldiers? That's what I want. <laughs> if you are, take that book in the back, send a note to your kids, vote from this book, your friends around the country, because you now have a lot of leverage. You're here, and you have just one representative and two senators. But you come from other parts of the country. Send that book. Tell them to look at the website. Tell them to write a letter to their representatives and senators and say, we heard this guy be appointed. We can't believe this. Tell us he's wrong. And you'll see the response you get. Okay? Probably a non-response. But you're going to get something. In any case, thank you for having me tonight. And I'm prepared to take on